Ian Forster's Morris was born of a visit Forster took in 1913 to the country home of poet, socialist, anti-industrialist, and LGBT advocate Edward Carpenter and his partner George Merrill. Forster recalls one of these visits in his terminal note to the novel. It must have been on my second or third visit to the shrine that the spark was kindled and he and his comrade George Merrill combined to make a profound impression on me and to touch a creative spring. George Merrill also touched my backside, gently and just above the buttocks. The sensation was unusual and I still remember it, as I remember the position of the long vanished tooth. It was as much psychological as physical. It seemed to go straight through the small of my back into my ideas, without involving my thoughts. After this visit, and spark of inspiration, Forster sat down to write Morris, a novel that tells the story of Morris Hall, who is a man quite unlike Forster. Forster describes him as handsome, healthy, bodily attractive, mentally torpid, not a bad businessman, and rather a snob. So Morris is the quintessential British middle-class gentleman. However, as the novel progresses, and he becomes more aware of his sexuality, uh, Morris begins to feel more and more alienated from the society that he's part of. So this begins early in the novel when Morris is at university and he meets Clive Durham and the two of them read Plato and muse about platonic love between men and as they continue through their education they, they do begin to act on their attraction for one another but Clive makes the decision to follow the expectations of his class and of society and he decides that he wants to marry a woman. So this devastates Morris who then acknowledges that he would never live a lie like that, and he acknowledges his own sexuality. So Morris goes out and tries to seek a cure for what he feels is an illness, and the second doctor that he visits tells him that he is afflicted with something called congenital homosexuality, and that there is indeed a cure, but of course there isn't, and so, um, so Morris is kind of subjected to this unsuccessful treatment. So while this is all happening, Clive gets married, and, and Morris and Clive still try to kind of maintain a friendship. And so while Morris is, is staying at the home of Clive, their gamekeeper kind of notices Morris. And there's a scene when, late at night, Morris is kind of calling out for something, and it's the gamekeeper that comes through his window and answers his call. So the gamekeeper, Alex Scudder, is Morris's new potential love interest, but of course Morris is, is quite apprehensive. In the end, Alec is that kind of balance that Morris needs, and and finally, after Morris acknowledges his sexuality, his, his um, role in the class system, and how he actually doesn't fit in, with, in British society, um, that's when he finds his happiness. So Morris wasn't published until 1971, a year after his death. Um, and that's in part because of how vulnerable and honest Forster was in writing this novel in the first place, and it was a very personal experience, but also due to the political climate at the time, it likely could not have been published, and if it was, it, it would have been suppressed. Twenty years earlier, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885, or the La Boucher Amendment, um, was put into effect. So this law stated that any male person who, in public or private, commits or is party to the commission of or procures or attempts to procure the commission by any male person of any act of gross indecency with another male person shall be guilty of a misdemeanor, and being convicted thereof shall be liable at the discretion of the court to be imprisoned for any term not exceeding two years with or without hard labor. So this is the legislation that criminalized homosexuality between men and then also, of course, influenced the way the public thought of homosexuality. And not only that, this very heavy legislation that was hanging over the heads of everyone um, promoted a kind of internalized homophobia among gay men, which is clear in the novel. The internalized homophobia and the feelings of pain and fear um, really come out in the language of this novel at certain parts, language like criminal, morbidity, loneliness, incestuous, mortification, and um, quite a few mentions of death and suicide. Around the same time as the La Boucher Amendment were the Oscar Wilde trials. So both of these historical events and legislations were very much part of the consciousness while Forster was like living his life and also writing this novel. Because of this, in the novel, Wilde's name becomes kind of shorthand for homosexuality. 
there's a scene where Morris visits um, a doctor that he's known for quite a period of time. And rather than saying very specifically why he's visiting, um, he uses Oscar Wilde's name as code. I say, in your rounds here, do you come across unspeakables of the Oscar Wilde sort? But Jout replied, no, that's in the asylum work, thank God. So you've never guessed, he said with a touch of scorn in his terror. I'm an unspeakable of the Oscar Wilde sort. His eyes closed, and driving clenched fist against them, he sat motionless, having appealed to Caesar. Who put that lie into your head? You whom I see and know to be a decent fellow? We'll never mention it again. No, I'll not discuss it. I'll not discuss. The worst thing I could do for you is to discuss it. I want advice, said Morris, struggling against the overwhelming manner. It's not rubbish to me, but my life. I've been like this ever since I can remember without knowing why. What is it? Am I diseased? If I am, I want to be cured. I can't put up with the loneliness any more the last six months especially. Anything you tell me, I'll do. That's all. You must help me. This feeling that Morris had, being ashamed, thinking that he was ill and seeking out a cure, but if that wasn't possible, then to hide who he truly was, might be something like what Forster was feeling that encouraged him to keep his manuscript only within a very small circle of his close friends. And this internalized homophobia can also be seen in Clive, who, after he makes the conscious decision to marry a woman, um, feels physically ill when he thinks of Morris or when he thinks of homosexuality. Clive is the one who introduced Morris to Plato and to the Greek classical thought of platonic love and Greece and classicism continue to come up as themes in the novel. So when Clive makes the decision, the conscious decision to do what society expects him to do, to marry a woman and leave Morris behind, it's a trip to Greece that marks the before and the after. Clive sat in the theater of Dionysus. The stage was empty as it had been for many centuries, the auditorium empty. The sun had set, though the Acropolis behind still radiated heat. Here dwelt his gods, Pallas Athene in the first place. He might, if he chose, imagine her shrine untouched, and her statues catching the last of the glow. She understood all men, though motherless and a virgin. He had been coming to thank her for years because she had lifted him out of the mire. So, while Clive is sitting in the theater of Dionysus, a god who is attributed to the body and the pleasures of the body. Um, Clive chooses to identify with Athena, who is the virgin goddess of civilization and of the mind. Clive chooses the mind over the body. And from this point on, when he thinks of Morris, or when he thinks of homosexuality, um, it's civilization and what civilization expects from him that causes him to withdraw and to feel physically ill at the thought of anything wild or not, not permitted by civilization. So even though he's made the conscious decision to do what civilization and his class expect of him, I think that he still realizes that it's not really who he is, it's a choice that he's made. He exclaims, um, how happy normal people made their lives. So he's aware that he's trying to be a normal person because that's what his class wants of him. Morris, on the other hand, acknowledges that to be happy and to be genuine, he needs to detach himself from his class. I want to be like other men, not this outcast whom nobody wants. I'm afraid I can only advise you to live in some country that has adopted the Code Napoleon, he said. I don't understand. France or Italy, for instance. Their homosexuality is no longer criminal. Will the law ever be that in England? I doubt it. England has always been disinclined to accept human nature. Morris understood. He was an Englishman himself, and only his troubles had kept him awake. He smiled sadly. It comes to this, then. There always have been people like me, and always will be, and generally they have been persecuted. That is so, Mr. Hall. And you must remember that your type was once put to death in England. Was it really? On the other hand, they could get away. England wasn't all built over and policed. Men of my sort could take to the Greenwood. It strikes me there may have been more about the Greeks 
Thieven Band, and the rest of it. I don't see how they could have kept together otherwise, especially when they came from such different classes. Again, the focus is on social class, because this is what, in Morris's case, is keeping him repressed. Edward Carpenter, who I've already mentioned earlier in this video, uh, who's also a member of the Bloomsbury Group and a mentor to Forster, wrote in Homogenic Love that same-sex love was what he called a powerful social force. He argued specifically that cross-class same-sex love was what class-conscious British society needed to solve the problems that such a class consciousness created. Carpenter, who admittedly was independently wealthy, um, also advocated for leaving the cities and leaving society in order to live a purer, cleaner life where one could thrive. And that's what he did. He made sandals. So I think Carpenter's influence really comes out in Morris, especially in the relationship between Morris and Alec. I think this is exactly the kind of relationship that Carpenter had in mind. For the section of the novel that Alec is, is part of, for a lot of that he's only referred to by his surname, which really kind of illustrates the distance between the middle class and the working class. But Alec is kind of the force that makes Morris really realize that in order to be happy he needs to kind of leave that class-driven society behind. On the doorstep something rejoined Morris, his old self perhaps. For as he walked along, a voice spoke out of his mortification, and its accents recalled Cambridge, a reckless, youthful voice that girded at him for being a fool. You've done for yourself this time, it seemed to say, and when he stopped outside the park because the king and queen were passing, he despised them at the moment he bared his head. It was as if a barrier that had kept him from his fellows had taken another aspect. He was not afraid or ashamed anymore. After all, the forests and the night were on his side, not theirs. They, not he, were inside a ring fence. He had acted wrongly and was still being punished, but wrongly because he had tried to get the best of both worlds. But I must belong to my class. That's fixed, he persisted. Very well, said his old self. Now go home, and tomorrow morning, mind you catch the 836 up to the office, for your holiday is over, remember. And mind you never turn your head as I may towards Sherwood. I'm not a poet, I'm not that kind of an ass. The king and queen vanished into their palace. The sun fell behind the park greens, which melted into one huge creature that had fingers and fists of green. The life of the earth, Morris? Don't you belong to that? Morris's call to the greenwood is recurring in this novel, from his references to Robin Hood and the Sherwood Forest, a vision of the green man that's presented to Morris and even Alec, who is connected to the forest through his profession as a gamekeeper. Morris finds his happiness when he exits that class-driven society and goes with Alec into the Greenwood, just as Carpenter and his partner George Merrill lived. Forster wrote in his terminal note, A happy ending was imperative. I shouldn't have bothered to write otherwise. I was determined that in fiction anyway, two men should fall in love and remain in it for the ever and ever that fiction allows. And in this sense, Morris and Alex still roam the Greenland. So, thank you for watching this discussion video of Ian Forster's Morris. It's one of my very favorites, and I'm really happy that I was able to finally get around to making a video about it. Um, so, please let me know if you've read it. Let me know if you want to read it. I would love to talk about it with you. I think it's such a beautiful novel, and it, it really is, um, it's really heartbreaking, but it's also so beautiful and yeah thanks for watching see you guys soon bye oh hi so um i took to twitter and i i asked what tags i should do because i feel like i'm so out of touch and a lot of people came back with the nsfw tag not so here and like i don't know it's big i like to have my neck covered okay two ever been in love yes ever had a terrible breakup? Eh, maybe not terrible, um, but some of them really sucked.